It's my very great pleasure to introduce Sarah Hymas, whose work I've been following with ever increasing admiration for nearly 30 years now. Born and brought up in Yorkshire and now a resident of Morecambe Bay, Sarah has actively shaped the poetic landscape of the Northwest and has emerged as a significant national voice at the interstices of eco-poetry, modernism and interdisciplinary writing. She is both a poet and maker whose insatiable creativity and profoundly ecological vision finds restless expression in innovative texts, handmade artist books, spoken word and music improv, blogs, multimedia exhibits and immersive walks, and I could probably go on. Uh, I'm sure I haven't exhausted um, Sarah's CV there. Sarah holds a doctorate in creative writing from Liverpool University, is the frequent recipient of grants and commissions, including funding to visit the Arctic Circle, and has been shortlisted for the International New Media Writing Prize and Ivan Juritz Prize, amongst others. As Sam has just said, Waterloo published Sarah's first poetry collection, Host, and we're exceedingly proud now to present Melt, which as its editor, I can tell you, takes an artisan's blowtorch to the boundaries between poetry, prose, philosophy, visual art, and book design. In so doing, Melt reenacts a series of intense encounters with ocean as vast, unknown, and fragile, remote, and yet also an assemblage of human and beyond human elements. Without further ado, let's dive in. I give you Sarah Hymas. Thank you, Naomi. That's a, that's a, um, I'm a bit, I'm a bit overwhelmed by the introduction. Um, so firstly, I would like to just uh, thank Naomi as my editor and Waterloo Press uh, for supporting uh, the publication of this book and enabling these this work to get out into the world um, and then for all of you to come here tonight to help launch it out into the world um, I really appreciate it and to launch it alongside uh, Catherine uh, it just feels like an extra extra bonus to that um, I wanted to spend uh, the most of this first slot of mine talking a little bit more about the um, about the thinking and the energy behind Melt. Um, it's kind of been a, a, a fairly slow burn project. As Simon mentioned, I, uh, my last book was published on, in 10 years ago. And since then I've been, uh, I've been making artist books and doing various other things that Naomi mentioned and increasing a preoccupation with the ocean, uh, which, which actually began over 30 years ago when I uh, miraculously managed to um, crew for people on, on boats uh, back in the day when that seemed to be so much more feasible than, than it is now. And, uh, and once I started to sail out at sea, uh, mainly in the North Atlantic and a bit in the South Pacific and in the Mediterranean, I sort of just fell in so much love and wonder and awe at the whole um, interaction of ocean, the energies of ocean, the forces of wind and currents and it just it just felt like an, an amazing world that I had not been uh, privy to prior to that in my early early years and through that time I then began to know about the creatures and the um, uh, the plants of both the ocean and the uh, seashore and just became more and more impassioned for it and then of course as you become more as I became more uh, knowing of the ocean I became more knowing of its precarity and so trying to kind of manage all these elements of my uh, experience understanding learnings and not knowings of of the ocean felt like a, um, a massive job that was possibly, uh, well it certainly was overwhelming in, in my attempt to try and reconcile it. So I do need to add at this point that um, I don't think uh, Melt would be uh, exist in this form if it wasn't for Darren Rees Jones who was my supervisor on the PhD and who challenged and uh, questioned and uh, supported my uh, workings through the book. Uh, so uh, yeah, while I had all that uh, sort of trying to reconcile all those elements, it felt uh, it needed a particular structure and, and I really 
feel that my work as an artist bookmaker specifically um, has fed into the structure of the book. So one thing that I uh, wanted to uh, just introduce is that some of the books come with a little nod to that whole uh, artist book and that is they come with a golden plankton i decided i'd call it the golden plankton as a, on this a little nod to charlie and the chocolate factory but uh, there's some random golden planktons which are these little um uh concertina tiny micro concertinas that feature a line of uh, poetry from the book and this idea of folds and infoldings and unfoldings is very much underpins the structure of the book. Um, there are illustrations of, um, of, the, uh, of the process of making an artist book as well as um, the, uh, uh, um, as, as, so they start off here and they sort of punctuate the book with the various uh, illustrations through. So that's one line of inquiry through the book. Other currents and cross currents come in the form of prose as Naomi said so the book begins at Morecambe Bay um, with the um, uh, a series of prose poems well pieces of prose poetic prose I don't know I don't know what these boundaries are really um, are based on a sea wall and they're interspersed with poems around uh, the intertidal zone and eventually the sea wall is breached by by more and more poems beginning to look at the um, uh, thinkings around mothering and maternity and motherhood. So we talk about um, mother earth, mother nature. And, and I became aware that I was quite interested in my own mothering and maternal nature um, as somebody who doesn't have children. And what, what the, how does that, uh, find find a place in the world so there's a sort of cluster of poems that explore notions of how we can mother the earth how the earth or ocean mothers us and um there's also at this point there's also this uh, series of uh, of ticker tape what i call ticker tape that follows along the bottom of the book for the rest of the book uh, that uh, follows uh, the breakdown of microplastic debris and tracks it from Morecambe Bay through the uh, various currents up to the Arctic. So it links the poems uh, in the end of the book of uh, the Arctic poems to Morecambe Bay, because as indeed the ocean is. I mean, it does it as we, as we know. It, it links it links us all together. So um, yeah, the the book ends in the Arctic with another sequence that is also um, disrupted by more poems, the sequence Melt, the title sequence, which uh, uh, is a, a nine poem sequence. And the whole Arctic section really does start to look at um, uh, the, the breakdown, the melting of, of the individual, of the sense of self. So this idea of Naomi talked about the book being an assemblage and I think the idea of the ocean as assemblage, ourselves as assemblage of the ocean um, uh, is very much explored in that final section. So there's this, uh, there, is a, there is a journey through, there's lots of cross currents, there's currents that go this way, currents that go the other way throughout the book. So it's um, hopefully very fluid, hopefully it absolutely captures some of the uh, forces of the ocean and uh, sometimes more benign than others uh, so I I thought I would read just three poems in this in this section I'll read some more obviously in the second slot to try and sort of just pitch pitch away through what I've just described of the book so this first poem Driftwood is uh, based is set on the sea wall uh, at, uh, at Morecambe Bay Driftwood. We could be pallbearers, slouching home with a spine of dead elm shoulder high. Our pacing coordinated to preserve length, coupling limbs, gnarled arms caught around the knot of memory. 
we listen to the squeal of salt logged sinew skinned in the North Atlantic drift. Rain makes everything slippery. Trunk straight, trunk crooked, trunk compressing trunks where we were so buoyant. There's no rolling free from the Gulf Stream's fate. We reel on, awkward, on uneven ground, with the weight of a warm nest. Judder as we heat, forward curl, under this unwieldy pressure, buffeted by wind. I eye the grain of our lineage, brine pulped. We are not myth, ancient or rotting, not yesterday, but today and tomorrow. Our niche as scavengers, we convey this rootless tree as others carry unborn children. Uh, this, this next poem, yeah, plays, picks up and plays around with that idea of maternity, mothering, and um, it actually, it's one of several poems that feature an octopus. There's, a, there's also a, an index in the book at the back. I've chosen to use an index rather than um, contents, which is sort of is a nod towards this idea of ocean as assemblage. And uh, if I, yeah, octopus, there are five poems that feature octopus in some form in the book. Uh, and this, this is one of them. And it begins with, uh, a line of washing. It's called Lines of Flight. I am trying to savour pegging each garment to the line rather than pinch this task of my mother, her mother and hers. Gusts of 35 miles an hour slap prehensile legs and arms, me wet and cold. Someone is berating you have not acquired a maternal patience. Another net pins an octopus wide, ringed suckers proud along its splayed marble body. When I catch my heart push against the swimmy blue flesh of an inside wrist, I wonder what stops us feeling the flush of blood through our body. You ought to consider yourself lucky living in a place where clothes can dry outside year round. Not all are mine. This trajectory of remote cells yanking at the cord between house and sea wall. Just their impetus. The octopus is taut, its tentacled brain shock wired as we try to disentangle blanched tips clasping the strings. In Finland, friends bring in midwinter boards of sheets and towels, drunk dry by continental air. Yes, we have compared washing stories. Here, the fabric's damp will reach the plants eventually, the detergent too. It is not my hand bending back waxy digits, attempting an unwrinkling of tents. Light shines through the weave, thinning with every wash. The flapping clothes insist all is well, a breezy faith they'll be worn again. Lurching forward, knotted, we leer over the trapped creature, urging it off, out, away. I am tied, not simply by gravity, whatever it is, is stubborn. Until flipping, plunged red, flushed scarlet, it pulses through water, brighter for the white it was less than a second ago. Sleek now, bullet riding zippered straights, a bloody gleam beating in the swill. And I'll finish this slot with one of the melt poems. Uh, so yeah, they, like I say, there's a sequence, the sequences, they're each called Melt and then they have a sub um, title and this one is called In Which Comfort Is Sought. And I was looking at it earlier today and I was feeling it felt very appropriate for now and these times of enforced isolation in which we are um, living. 
and this desire for, for contact so melt in which comfort is short, sought. I find myself wanting to hold, be held by a body as fleeting as mine in the face of something too large to see. The smallest algae will survive these conditions, their resistance to sinking. So small, I might not count. Turn me smaller than small. Multitude defends. Breathing is believing. A comma of chlorophyll. Many commas punctuate many ripples amongst a legion of crossing streams falling to sediment. Snow, millions coiling across the glass parent that'll never be full. Every exhale extends nine months, a year, decades. I find myself wanting to hold and be held. <laughs>